What's up, everybody? In this episode, I interviewed Joe Mitchell. If you guys don't know who Joe is, he's a great employee for Cards and Culture, somebody that I've really grown fond of over the last couple months, actually almost a year, we found out in the episode, uh, because he's been working here for a year. So I interviewed Joe, talked to him, asked him some questions about him, what makes him him, just like I normally do in most of my podcasts, but uh, we flipped the script, the script a little bit. Uh, and Joe asked me some questions. It was really cool. Joe has his own podcast called The 10 Second Runoff. Um, and so he asked me some things about me, what made me come to LSU, talked about some baseball stories, my draft story, winning the national championship. So hope you, hopefully you guys enjoy the episode. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Up and In Show. I'm Anthony Renato. I am here at Cards and Culture on the Purple Couch, and I'm fired up about this episode um, because even though we've had some technical difficulties in this episode, I am fired up because Joe is a rock star. He's been an employee for Cards and Culture since, when did you start here? May, June, May. somewhere nice. in there. Coming up on a year. Let's yep. go. All right, so Joe uh, is a kid from Baton Rouge. Um, Went to Catholic high, played uh, high-level football, had some injuries, and unfortunately couldn't play at the college level, but has lived here in Baton Rouge for a while and is super uh, passionate about football. Has his own podcast called The 10-Second Runoff um, and just done an incredible job with our multimedia and, and helping me with my podcast and storytelling. And uh, I'd, like I said, I, I've, I've guessed you up behind closed doors a lot, but this is a really cool opportunity for me to talk a little bit about your skill set and the things that I think that you, know, you bring to the table. So, Joe Mitchell, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you and and your time and all that. Appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely, man. And just even little things like you messaging me last night about some ideas that we had, you know, and um, I've been in business now three or four years, five years, shit, and have invested in businesses and been around things. And, um, you know, from the startup standpoint, the way you care about cards and culture uh, means the world to me. And then messages like last night where I know you're at home on your off day, dropping me a book about ways that I can grow my personal brand and Anthony Renato can grow and do things for cards and culture. So uh, that's a long winded intro, but I appreciate you. And I, and I appreciate the things that you do for, for cards and culture and from, for me as Anthony Renato. So thank you, dude. I appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, even though I give you a long winded intro, why don't you give us a two minute um, rundown on of who you are, how you see yourself, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, you touched on a lot of the things. I don't know how high level I played football, but <laughs> but I mean, I played high school football. That's all right. Hey, um, Catholic's yeah. a fucking good school. They win the yeah. state championship every yeah, year. Right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I did. Uh, I, I do. Yeah, five a. I, I do enjoy football. Uh, like you said, we have the podcast, the 10-second runoff that we do here. Thank you for allowing us to do that in the first place. Um, do all the editing, video production here for the long-form content. Recently started working on some TikToks for the Up and In show. Uh, So excited about that. But right now, that's kind of where I'm at. And I'm putting all my effort into, you know, creating a path where that can be what I do long term. And, uh, you know, eventually build a family and all that based on what I'm doing now. Your career. Yeah. No, I love that, man. And I I, I think something for me, I don't know, I've kind of talked to you about it, obviously, and interview stuff and business stuff. But Where's your vision come from, from marketing? I know this episode is going to be a little bit about you asking me some questions too and and creating some content, but I want our listeners to get to know you a little bit and everything. And I think you've done a really great job at, how old are you, 22? I'm 23. 23. 23 years old, marketing a business and storytelling, you know, on a level that to me is really impressive without a degree or a background in anything like that. So where does your marketing eye or media kind of vision come from? Yeah, so... um, kind of from there, right? Like, so growing up, I always had this idea that I was going to go play football in college and figure out a way to, you know, make that a career. Mm -hmm. That didn't work out. And I don't know if it would have, even if I hadn't gotten hurt, but I I learned very quickly that wasn't going to be the case. Um, I knew college was not for me. I went, I went to LSU. I did the, did the whole party thing. (laughs) Um, And I, you know, it it wasn't for me. I wasn't going to sit there through uh, four years of school and, and, and be successful that way. Matter of fact, what I was studying was I was in kinesiology with a focus in fitness studies because I was like so passionate about fitness. I, I had ideas of wanting to start a gym and be a personal trainer and, and you know, turn that into a career. Um, and, it, you know, that helps. Obviously, yeah. having the degree helps. But in that fit, fitness industry, you can just go get a personal training certification. Right. Right. And so I, I got into I worked at Gold's Gym out in Prairieville for a little while. I became the general manager there. Um, really enjoyed that. Learned. I 
I learned a lot of experience and how to manage a business. You know, no matter how well a business is doing, I, yeah. I learned how to do that, how to take on bills. And at the time, I was 20, 21. Uh, so it was a lot of responsibility that just forced me to kind of mature and, and look at how a business works. Um, that paired with I didn't go to school yeah. was kind of like, okay, how can I take this – how can I take this short amount of knowledge that I've learned and create a, create a scenario where I don't feel like I'm necessarily working for someone else? Yeah. Um, and now granted I do, right? I work for you. I work for cards and culture, but I've just, I've gotten to a point since the first day I've come in here. I was like, this place is awesome. I totally see the vision. Um, and it's something that I kind of latched onto where I feel like it's something that I am so passionate about that I don't feel like I'm just working for you to achieve your dream. Right. Um, that so. means the world to me right there. I'm so happy that you said, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. But that was something that was really important to me was to create a business where I felt like the employees, because, you know, I think for a business to grow and to be truly successful, you need your employees to be on board, right? Yeah, and yeah. how are they ever going to care about a business as much as you do if they don't have a vested interest in it, right? Yeah. So I always wanted to create opportunity for employees to see a path where they could be an executive or have ownership or be a part of a, a company on a bigger scale. So I appreciate you saying that because sometimes it does feel like I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a I'm boss, I'm an employer and stuff like that. And I hate that. I, lo I like certain aspects of it, right, but right. I enjoy the team aspect more, right? We're all in this together. We're all yeah. doing this. I know the pay might be different, you know, one day, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm not getting paid for anything right now. I'm starting this up, you know, like, and, yeah. and, and facilitating it. So I always wanted you guys to feel that way. And that means the world to me. So I'm happy that that has played a role in why you're good at media and, and storytelling, because, um, I think that's important to the, to the authenticity and the organic like marketing yeah. of things. So what about podcasting? Like, I, I think you're really, I think you're really great at podcasting, talking. Did you guys, did you ever have formal teachings of that in high school growing up or anything? I took a semester of speech in really? high school. In high school they yeah. taught that? But that's yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. But that was, that was it. And yeah. I mean, it was, it was on speech giving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like public speaking or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and uh, you know, and I guess I, I guess I did take a semester of, of public speaking in college as well, but I didn't go off. <laughs> <and> <laughs> like, like, yeah. You weren't present. Uh, right, much, right. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, that, I guess you can, yeah. I guess you can, you know, credit it to that. But also, whenever we're doing the 10 second runoff and I'm in that podcast flow, I'm talking about something I know and care about. True. It, it would be very difficult to sit down and talk about, you know, I'm I'm not super well versed in basketball. If I had a ba basketball podcast, I'd suck at it. Yeah. So I think Makes it's just, I think yeah. it's just more so finding your niche and, and then diving in. Your passion, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that I think you are like the definition of our new generation, though. Too like not going to school, but having a good skill set already. You're 23 years old, and I feel like you're very adequate at what you do. Like, and even just your learning curve, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think people get caught up in needing a degree or a piece of paper to say that they're qualified to do something, but you were also born into a generation where you were on your phone learning things your whole yeah. life, right? So you were self-taught in so many different ways. And that's why it's like, hey dude, if you want to learn podcast production, go for it. And you did. Yeah. And if you want to learn Photoshop, go for it. You did. And you've executed and stuff. So I'm like, shit, the learning curve for this guy is, is really impressive. And that, to me, is, like, uh, you know, a really valuable thing as an employee. So I, I, th I'm, I went to school and did all that shit. You know, I played baseball and then finished my degree. So, I, like, I have a degree, but I appreciate the newer generation and where you guys are at and not necessarily needing that. So mm -hmm. I think it's cool. I think, that's, I think that's really important, and it's something that people have to have, uh, especially with our generation having fewer and fewer people go to college and university. Um, because, and this is, so some, somebody close to me told me when I was young that I have, I have had people tell me luck doesn't exist. And then I've had people tell me luck do, does exist. Yeah. Um, but one of the people closest to me that told me luck did exist, he defined it way differently than I'd ever heard it. And I'm sure some people may have, yeah. but, uh, he, he said luck exists, but it's not as you think it. It's, it's actually L U C K labor under correct knowledge. He says, Luck is something that happens happens to you, but not because you not because you earned it, and it doesn't happen to everybody. But if you don't put yourself, if you don't prime yourself in a situation where you can get lucky, if you don't give yourself equip yourself with the tools to have a big break or a good break, well, then you'll never get lucky. Yep. You have to you have to even the odds a little bit. Yeah. And so whenever I came in here, I didn't know anything about media, or I didn't know anything about Photoshop or Adobe Premiere. 
Uh, but whenever that opportunity presented itself, I was like, okay, well, if this is, if I want to find myself and create a role that I can see myself here in 20, 30 years, I need to equip myself with the tools. So. Dude, I love that. I think, I think that skill set too. And like that mindset, I should say, because I think luck is created. That's mm-hmm. what I, and I think that's a version of what you're just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That person was saying is you have to put yourself in that position to be lucky, you know, yeah. to have that luck be fortunate and be on your side, right? Because it could be on your, on the other side if you weren't there, if you weren't in the right situation. Right, absolutely. Look at that same situation as bad luck because I didn't go to this thing or I didn't put myself there or mm-hmm. meet this person, right? So. I, I love that definition of luck. And so what was it? L-U-C-K. What, what did it stand for? Labor under correct knowledge. So so working with the knowledge that something can't happen for me if I don't create an environment for it to happen. Oh, fuck. I love that. Probably shouldn't have said fuck because that was probably a good <laughs> c- clip right there to cut. But I really do like that. And I believe in that. And it, I, I really appreciate hearing things when I'm like, that's the way I think already. And there's just a, a name to it now or something yeah. or an acronym behind it, you know, or something. Yeah. So that's really cool. What's, um, what's been your most rewarding thing since you've been here? Because there's been a lot of things, ups and downs is coming up on a year. Um, and <laughs> your roles have changed, you know, a bunch of different ways. And yeah. I think it's because you, you started part time and have worked your way up. So mm-hmm. what's been the most rewarding thing so far? Um, the, the, <clears throat> Honestly, I, I feel like I'm a lot closer now. And obviously there's a, you know, boss employee relationship, but I feel like I'm I feel like I'm a lot closer now with you and with Jonah and I've gotten close with Mikey and Maya. I feel like we have a very good community setting within our employees. Um, but also seeing the work that you've done over the years with Up and In Show and then how we're transitioning that into long form and then breaking it down even to shorter form putting it in two different places, having it on the Cards and Culture website, then moving it to YouTube shorts and TikToks and Instagram reels. And just seeing that, um, seeing that kind of, you know, integrate into the, into the social media market. um, I think that's super fascinating. And it's, it's very cool to see the work that, that we're collectively doing gain traction. Yeah. No, I love that. And I think it's, it's definitely been trial and error. So it's like, it's very rewarding when it hits and you're like, we figured something out. Let's yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, that's awesome. I love hearing that. What advice would you give for somebody? Cause so I speak at entrepreneur classes, you know, every semester at LSU and there's always people asking me, what would you do? What would you tell 20 year old Anthony or 21? If you were me sitting in this chair, what would you tell yourself? Um, and I feel like every semester it's different for me. It changes depending on, you know, how I'm seeing the world. There's an overall message that I feel like I leave with them, but it always changes. So I'd be anxious to see what, what your mindset would be at 23 years old and kind of given the journey that you've been through so far. So if I could just talk to myself three years ago, um, I would just tell myself. What to about graduating high school? Because at 20, you're already in school and maybe past, but yeah, like yeah, graduating yeah, yeah. high school. Uh, I would say to, I would probably tell myself that all the plans that I had then, and pro- even tell myself now, I would say all the plans that I had then, not to, you know, disqualify them or anything like that, still put 100% effort, but to have an open mind. And an open mind is something that can't be beat because if you're willing to learn something that's going to put you in a better posi- in a better position, well, you're going to be in a better position. Yeah. Uh, and so at the time I was so locked in, focused on fitness and wanting to do, you know, the, the fitness industry and all that. And now I don't even look like that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And so it's just... Had I had I been open, more open minded and did more things, then I feel like I would be two, three years ahead of where I am now. I love that. I and I think as you get older too, because I think at 30, 33, I had to think about my age. There for a second. I'm like, <laughs> am I thirty four? Why did I think that for a second? Um, I'm still having that too, like the same thing, right? Like I feel like I'm always learning things and thinking like, man, if I just would have learned this three years earlier, I'd be so much more ahead of where I am right now. Yeah. But I think that's what life is. And then just making that that time frame shorter. So if, if it was three years, right, maybe, man, maybe I learned this in two years, you know? Mm-hmm. And then the next time, like your reflection period is just shorter. Yeah. And the amount of time that it, like the mistakes or the things that you wish you would have done happen quicker. And then there's less room. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I also probably what I would tell myself too, just to just to piggyback off of that, is you know everybody likes to think they they know it all. Like it's just human nature. We tend to do that. I do that to myself now. I, that you know, hey, I had this idea. I need to see it through. Yeah. But in reality, if I'm 18 and I've only had 18 years of life experience, and really probably eight to ten of those really mean anything, right. um, well, I have people in my life who are 30, 40, 50, have so many more years. 
But as a kid, you're just so defiant. You, you don't want to listen to what people say, but that's the best thing you can do is just listen to people. Like whenever I can't, I put myself in this, this situation where I have you, uh, some of your business partners that I've been able to speak with, uh, the people that come into your podcasts. Well, I hear everything y'all are saying and I'm like, okay, these are, these are people who have done well, who have in all different industries. If I can apply this to fit my life in some capacity, I'm going to do a lot better. That to me is what I think maturation is, right? Especially as a man, because yeah. I'm not saying, I don't know what a female maturation mindset is like, but I think as men, we're so arrogant and not arrogant, but like confident and cocky. And it's been taught to yeah. us as the providers and all these things, the societal, right? That we need to know things and we need to be educated or smart. And so it's like, you think you know everything, but really what you the best things that I've learned in life or the, is just experience doing things, messing up, having successes, yeah. right? All that shit. So like, that's what my podcast has always been about for me is I learned so much from podcasts in a year or two after playing baseball. Cause I never listened to podcasts when I was playing baseball. Cause I thought I was the best and I was, there was yeah, nothing yeah, to yeah. listen to, you know, like I was, I knew everything. So when I was done, I was humbled immediately, right? Exercising humility. I start listening to these podcasts and I'm just picking up on so much stuff from just people's experiences. Not that they're teaching me a course or anything like that, but they're just telling me their life story or, or telling somebody their life story. And I'm like, oh, okay, there's been opportunities in my life where I've seen that, done that. I can avoid this. I can try this. Right. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like that's what you're doing too. And every time you meet Brian Dennison or somebody that comes in, right, yeah. a handshake, an impression, all that stuff, you never know how it goes or where yeah. it goes. And um, or what relationships you, you know, you might develop. Mm -hmm. I did tell somebody this in the entrepreneurship class. They were talking to me. They were like, how did you meet your, um, your investors for your business? And I was like, actually, one of them was a mentor that I literally just took out for coffee once a month because I just picked his brain and we just shot the shit and we talked a little bit yeah. and I had no intentions of him ever investing in my business. But four years later, he saw the, the guy that I was, the vision that I had. He was in the right, it was right timing, luck, right? All these things that, came to fruition because I put myself in that position. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, you know, I tell people, tell you guys all this all the time, go take Brian Dennison out to lunch. It don't matter. Just, and he'll probably pick up the tab anyway. You know what I'm saying? But offer him that. And that's what you can offer him, but he'll be happy to share his life experiences, his or her, everybody who, who you ask. And to me, that's how you level up in life is just learning from older people and wiser people. And yeah. shit. That's what wisdom is. Just more laps around the sun. That's mm -hmm. it. What about your mindset and everything? Because, so you and I are both doing this hard 75 right now. Yeah. And if you guys aren't familiar with hard 75, it's, there's a couple pillars in it, but you pick a diet that you stick to. There's no alcohol. You drink a gallon of water a day. Um, you read 10 pages of a book a day and you have to complete two workouts, one being outside for 40 and both of them are for 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, but the other day I was at, you know, the, the beer place and I wanted to drink and I was texting you and you were just motivating. You were just very accountable to me. Where does that mindset come from where you're thinking differently and you're kind of that higher level power thinker? Um, I think I just grew up very, very competitive. Um, I love in it. all yeah. honesty, yeah, my, yeah. my, my dad, my uncle, my grandfather, they all played baseball at the collegiate level. So me as the defiant kid, I was like, <laughs> I'm not playing baseball. <laughs> yeah. but I'm play football and bang my head against <laughs> shit. Yeah. And then I did for yeah. sure. Um, but yeah, they all just, but they all had that cons that competitive spirit and they instilled that in me. Um, and whenever I had to stop playing sports, I was 17 years old, but that competitive spirit didn't go away. Yeah. And when I wasn't playing against people, it wasn't like, I'm going to be better than that person. It's it more so transitioned into, I can be better than I am. Um, and so whenever I, I do 75 hard once a year. Yeah. So this is my third year doing it. I've completed it twice. Um, and it's just, I dread it going into it. Like the day before, yeah. I'm like, God, I don't want to. I don't want to commit to this for 75 days. Yeah. But I'm like, at this point, I've done it two years in a row. If I don't do it for the third year, well, I, I regressed. I regressed over a year. Yeah. And I can't do that. And yeah. I don't even want to just say the same. I want to continue to get better. Right, so right. what can I do? What can I learn during this period? That I'm, and 75 days is nothing. Yeah. 75 days is less than a quarter of the year. Yeah. It's. A, you know, a little blip on your timeline of life. So I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll do this and I'll commit to it. But how can I use this to make me better this year than I was last year? I love that. And that's what life is, right? It's just built, put it, I always say feathers in the cap, you know, it's like, yeah. it's a new skill set. It's something I learned. It's something I picked up. 
And it, and it could be like, maybe you picked up that you like drinking and you, <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want to go 75 days. Yeah. Just, but, uh, but like little things like that, you know, or like things that you actually learn about yourself and, and uh, the trials and ch- like last night was a, I was just, it was a hard night for me. I wanted dessert so bad. Like there were so many things, like I was watching some games and I just wanted to drink a beer, like just yeah. little things, you know, or like today we got cookies. March in Madness here. too. March Madness, everything. Yeah. I'm going to Vegas at the end of the month. Like, but it shows you the capabilities that you have as a human too, mm-hmm. right? Like you might think, man, I can't go to Vegas and not drink. I can't go to St. Patrick's Day on a float and not drink, right? But sometimes you actually, I went to Uncle Earl's two weeks ago because I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to yeah. prove to myself that I could do this. I could stand in a bar. I could have everybody ask me for a drink, challenge me with a shot, ask me why I'm not drinking. And I could stand there and tell them with a straight face and be confident and be like, no, I can still have a good time. You won't even know that I'm not drunk, you know? Yeah. So it's little things like that that I think are really cool about that. that I'm excited about to see how it goes for 75 days. Yeah. I want to do it for 90, I think, too. Now you see you're, you're stretching now it push a it. Bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I feel like I was a little half-assed in the beginning, like the first couple, like the re- re- first week of like a diet. I stuck to no wheat, no matter what, but it was like, I was still eating out, you know, like now I feel like I'm in a great routine and I just want to keep the routine going for like true 75 days. Like, mm-hmm. and so I don't know. And I, I kind of just like, like you said, I want to level up a little bit and like, oh, everybody did 75. That's cute. I did 90 just for fun. Like just to, just to just feel good about myself a little bit, you know? I don't know. So yeah, it's, it's a cool thing and I'm enjoying the experience so far. So it is. And I, so a lot of times, cause we all get that temptation, especially with something like this, you want to break it. Like you get to day 14, you get to day 17, somewhere in there. And you're like, do I really want to do this for another 50 days? <laughs> Seriously though. You're no, like, do I, I really yeah. want to do this for another 50, 60 days? And so what, what I do, and it's going to sound like comparison, but it, it, it's not, it's, it's, it's more so just, you know, Using it as motivation. So what I do is I, you know, you can look up hashtags. I go to Twitter and Instagram, look up hashtag 75 hard. I'll see all the people who have completed it and all that. And not to say that I'm, not to say, not to pit my mental toughness against them. That's not the point. But I can say all of these people did it. Like all all of these people in here did it. What's making them into, like, if they can do it, why can't I? And if I can't, well, now I'm I'm less mentally tough than them. And I, I, I want to, I can't accept that. Yeah. That's what you said. That, that honestly, like the mental toughness part of it is when you texted me that message when I was at rally cap, that's what stuck with me was like, I think you actually said exactly that. You're like, there's so many people that have done it. And like, you're not, you're, you're just as mentally strong, if not stronger than them. And I was like, you're right. I am. I'm good. You know what yeah. I'm saying? But that's, and it's, it's the, it's not comparison. I think it's just p- possibility. Right. right? It's right. the same thing of like, if I wanted to try to run a four minute mile right now, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to watch people doing it and show my brain, Hey, this is, this is humanly possible. You can mm-hmm. do this. Like, yeah. and here's a bunch of people that have, I'm not comparing yourself, but are you better than them? Just as good? Probably like you're fine. Like you can do this shit, you know, yeah. just positive affirmation. So I love that. What else, man? What else do people need to know about Joe Mitchell? Is there anything you want to leave them with or anything along those lines? Um, not, not necessarily about me. I mean, I do, you know, like I said, I edit the videos. I try to come up with content from from what from what's in the long form, long form podcast for up and in. I just try to try to break them down, find the sixty second gems, and, and post them. Yeah. Um, and you know, obviously, add video and all that, the text. Um, but that's it. And so, really, what I thought would be great with this episode was be to just let me kind of pick your brain and come up with a few of those. I like that. And as I was like. I like the idea when <clears throat> when we talked about it because, like, like I said, I like to introduce. I've had almost everybody that's worked here on the on a podcast at some point. Um, I like to let people know about the individual, but I loved your idea about this, and I think you're like I said, you're a host of a podcast, so it made sense. And like I said, I, I think one day you're going to be involved in this podcast in a cool way, whether it's you know, hey, make sure you ask them this question, <laughs> you know, little things like that. Um, but I, I'm excited about this, so I can talk a little bit about myself some more. Yeah, don't, listeners don't always get all this stuff from me. So yeah, yeah, good. yeah, yeah. We'll see, we'll see if they like it. I could lose all my my listeners. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, we'll learn something if that yeah, happens. There we go. <laughs> exactly. We'll always learn something. There's always something to learn, which is the yeah. good part. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, we've all heard the story about how you know we all heard the story about how you were expecting to go to Vanderbilt. You you know we're gonna you're looking at Virginia had the offer from Alabama. You're gonna go on your official there. Um, you had kind of been bullied into even taking the official at LSU. But you got here and you, you know, t- you committed on the spot. Yep. Do you want to hear something funny really quick before yeah, I go ask ahead. your question? Go ahead. I was just thinking about this. On my, I don't think I've ever told you this. On my trip to Alabama, maybe I did, but 
So I went to my visit on Alabama at Alabama, and sometimes they give you the offer before time, so you kind of know like whether I'm if this offer is even good enough. Because in baseball, you only get thirteen point nine right. scholarships for thirty five guys. So there's always a percentage of a scholarship that you're getting. It's very rare that a guy gets a hundred percent scholarship. So I hadn't had my scholarship offer yet, but I knew they were going to offer me. Last day, we walk into the office. The ma- I don't want to say his name, but the coach sits down, and he's you know, having a conversation, he's like, so this is the point that we offer the scholarship, and you're well aware, Anthony, that, you know, we only get 13.9% uh, scholarships per player, um, so I'm going to slide across two offers to you. You can pick whichever one you want, but, you know, um, one's going to be a little bit more than the other one, but the other one, if you want to be a team player and, you know, li- leave a little bit of room on, on the bone to go get other good players, like, do that, like, whatever you think, and I was like, okay, so I, li- I look at these co- two scholarships, 78%, 88%, and I was like, I'm going to take the 88%. He goes, <laughs> yeah, most kids do. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. I looked at my mom and dad. I was like, was this a setup or a trick question? I'm like, yeah. like right? I picked the right one, right? Yeah, yeah. You guys didn't want to pay 10% more for me to go to yeah. college, They're right? They're trying to, like, test if you're going to be a good teammate yeah, I was while like, giving you the offer anyway. Yeah, and I was <laughs> like, this is so weird. Anyway, so I thought that was, like, a really a unique thing that always stuck in, my, stuck in my head. I was like, is this a setup? This was weird. I don't know. So, yeah, it was, it was interesting. So I took the 88% scholarship but didn't go to Alabama, obviously. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so so you you get off the plane in Baton Rouge, right, or New Orleans? Yeah. I don't know if you drove drove here or whatever, but I think you it was get, Baton Rouge. Yeah. You get to your visit in in Baton Rouge, and then you commit the next day. So something had to happen within that twenty four forty eight hour time yeah. frame because you weren't even considering, and then you committed. Yep. Walk me through that. I got off the plane and yeah. got off the plane and immediately thought how freaking humid it was here. <laughs> I was like, this is crazy. Like, and at the time I was a kid from New Jersey. So <laughs> I was like, I want to go somewhere hot. I want to sweat. I love sweating. I feel better and loose when I was pitching, you know, all this mm-hmm. stuff. So I was, that was immediately like, all right, cool. This place is warm. Like we weren't, yeah, yeah. we weren't fucking around with this. So, um, and we landed super late. I don't know if we got delayed. It was my dad and I, mm-hmm. and I get off the plane. That was my first thought. <laughs> then uh, we started driving around or whatever. We get the rental car and we drive to our hotel because it was super late. The coach, coaches didn't pick me up or anything because I think it was like literally 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. or yeah, something yeah. like that. Um, we rent our car and we're driving around. And I remember looking out and being like, this isn't like the water boy at all. Like I thought it was like we were going to have houses on the water. Like yeah. I was like, this is like a normal city. Like this is kind of cool. All right. Um, <clears throat> and we get into Baton Rouge. We get into the hotel and I look at my dad and I'm like, dude, I'm hungry you think anything's open? He's like, I don't think so, dude. He was like, I'll call Terry right now, Terry Rooney. So he calls Rooney. Raising Canes? No. Not oh, that. okay, okay. I did hear that story, though, on the trip because they did tell me it, but it was a basic-ass IHOP but okay. on college. But Terry Rooney at 3 a.m. picks up my dad's call. He's like, what's up, Mr. Renato? How we doing? And I'm, I'm like, I'm like, damn, he was awake? He was like, and uh, just look at my dad, and he was like, he's, he answered. And so he's like, uh, hey, man, you know, we're kind of hungry. Is there anything open that we could eat, you know, like blah, blah, blah? And he was like, I'll be there in five minutes. So we're like, okay. So he comes and picks us up at 3 a.m. and we go to IHOP and we sit at IHOP at 3 a.m. and we crush food. And I fell in love with Terry Rooney right there. Like he was awesome. just, he was just the man. Like, and to this day, I saw him at one of my buddy's weddings um, and we shot the shit for like an hour and a half. And it was weird because Terry recruited me and we had a really great relationship. In the back of my mind, I knew he was recruiting, right? Like I knew he was probably saying it to five other guys and all this right. stuff too. But I did feel a human connection with him when I sat there and I appreciated it. And I made sure to tell him that a couple of years ago at the wedding. So he was he was a big reason um, that I originally fell in love with LSU. So that was 3 a.m. Then the next morning, we wake up at 9, and I had the whole, you know, campus, Cox yeah. building, yeah, the yeah. stadium. Then they showed me – I sat with Skip in his office, and that was fucking awesome. Skip, my dad – I don't know if Terry was there. I don't know if he was there. It might have been just us three. Um, and he sat there and talked to us for 30 minutes, and that, that sold me, honestly. I think when I was talking to Skip and just watching – we were sitting in the athletic office looking over the whole campus and he was showing me the plans for the new stadium and stuff and selling me. Uh, that was what did it for me. And I was like, I just want to be here. I want to be at LSU. I want to be an LSU baseball player. And when I walked on the field, the, it was the old box too. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I just want to pitch in this stadium more than anything in the world. Like the, yeah. the energy, the oldness of it, but like how nice the grass was, you know, like I'm a kid from New Jersey. We play on shitty ass fields. Like to be in a stadium that holds 8,000 people, purple and gold, like with all this tradition and history, I was like, there's nowhere else that can compare to this. I don't care about how good Vanderbilt is right now. I don't care about their number one overall picks. They haven't won world series is like, you know, like mm-hmm. all this shit. They, they just got me at LSU and then I bought in and I fell in love on the spot. So that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. It that's was awesome. It was great. It really <laughs> was. Yeah. It's, it's cool to hear, too, just because of 
being an employee, I know what you preach to us. It's always customer experience, customer experience, customer experience, uh, which obviously is utmost importance. If you got off a plane, not, not expecting to even be interested <laughs> in LSU yeah. and Terry Rooney, the way he talked to you and treated you completely flipped it. Yep. Like that led to an LSU national championship. It led to you being at LSU pitching and then going to the major leagues. Like all that, that interaction between you and Terry Rooney is something that we as employees need to need, you know, like that's something we can take. Dude. I love that. I, I, I'm really loving this moment right here. Just like, reflecting on that and then just even hearing you say yeah. that because it is like it's those little things that were instilled in me at a young age that was that were very formidable right yeah and it's like now I'm running a business I want people to feel the same way that I felt when I came yeah. here so no, that's cool that's super cool yeah I love that's that. really cool love that yeah. all right so y'all have obviously a great season uh, well let's let's jump to the 2009 year yeah. right so y'all have a great season you have the regional you, you know you end up getting to Omaha yep. okay in Omaha Walk, walk me through that. I know it's the, the final series. It's a three-game series with Texas. Y'all are split 1-1. Game three for it all, what's the mindset in the locker room? What are y'all hearing from Coach Maneri? Like, as a team, how are y'all – y'all are already prepared, but as a team, how are y'all approaching this game? Is it anything different? Is it business as usual? That's a great question. I love that. So, the year before we had made it to Omaha, I was a freshman. Mm-hmm. And I th- we lost the first game, won the second, lost the third. So we were out really quick. Yeah. I remember standing on the field with Austin Ross, one of my boys. And I, and I remember looking at him and being like, bro, we're coming back here next year. We're Stephon coming- Diggs style. Yeah. That was, oh, that's it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. Yep. And I remember looking at, I remember the lights were going off. And I remember looking at him and be, oh, it was because we had a drug test too. We had to like, it was the most depressing like last day ever there. Like we were standing there and we had to go, you know, some people have to wait to piss cause like it's, Mm-hmm. They just spring it on you, you know? Yeah. And so we were just standing there, and I'm like, bro, we're coming back here next year. We're winning this whole thing. Like, mm-hmm. this year was fun. It was cool. Him and I were roommates and stuff, and it was like, it was fun to experience all this. But we're taking names next year when we come here. Like, this is our thing. He was like, no doubt. So I felt like I wasn't – and that was only me and Austin and I at that in that moment. And I feel like there was 10 other dudes that said the same thing or, like, had the same experience in their moment, you know, however it was. So when we came back my sophomore year – it wasn't, it, it was business as usual mm-hmm. in the sense of like the same way we played 56 regular season games, we're here to win. Like, that's it. It's not cool. The autograph signing, we don't care. Yeah. We've we done it all. We hit all the, we checked all the boxes in the past. We're trying to win some games and win this trophy and, and take it home to Baton Rouge and win our sixth championship. So that was kind of the mindset. Like when we were doing all the festivities and all that stuff, we knew we were going to be there for two weeks. We had the best hotel. We had it like, we had all the right things set yeah. up. Um, and then we lose that second game in the series. So we, we, we win all our round robins. We win against Arkansas to get to the championship series. Then we, you know, won one against Texas. And I'm going to try to say this, not tearing up, because I've told Coach Maneri this story, and I've, like, ball, I've like teared up about it because it brings back a lot of emotion for me. Mm. Um, I remember, so we lost to Texas, and Taylor Youngman pitched against us. A CG, he fucking, he shoved it up our asses. Like, it was, we had... We beat them in extra innings the night before, and we thought we were going to beat them 20 to nothing in that game. And he came in and just slammed the door against us with dominating stuff, nine innings. And so we were kind of like, ooh, all right, punched in the face a little bit, right? And so we're yeah. all in the circle after the game, and the first thing Maneri says to, to us, like he doesn't say anything about the game, nothing. He just goes in the, in, the, in the thing, he just looks at us and goes, all right, boys. So if I would have told you on August 19th when you guys showed up on campus that on June 24th, this, this next year, we would have a one-game winner-take-all for the national championship with Anthony Renato on the mound. How would you guys feel? I'm, I'm not even kidding, bro. I fucking – I remember looking at him and being like, I want to pitch right now. And all the guys were like – he was like – so everybody was like – you could just feel the energy change in the sense of like everybody was like, fuck yeah, let's go. Like, like with that perspective, and then Maneri was like – he was like, that's right. He was like, so we're going to get on that bus. We're going to blast music like we just kicked Texas's ass. We're going to go back to the hotel tonight. You guys are going to get some great sleep, and we're going to win our sixth national championship tomorrow. And I was just like, let's go. I would run through a wall right now. So, yeah. like, I don't know, but it was just it was the craziest shit ever. And I remember being on the bus that next day, pulling up to the field and grabbing Nick Pontiff and Chris McGee and Buzzy Hado. And I was like, I don't care what you guys got to do today. Meet me at the line every inning. I want you guys to jack me up, fire me up. Let's go. I want it all. Like, this is – and it was just like, dude, it was the craziest thing ever, just, like, having that emotion and, like, 
the confidence going into that last game yeah. was wild. It was really wild. And I think it was a lot because of what Coach Maneri said mm. and the way he framed things and put things in perspective for us. It was yeah. cool. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. That's one of the cooler stories I've heard. That's yeah. cool. It was – dude, I, I can't tell you 19 years old with – you know, I was 19 and I realized what – was on my shoulders for this next game, right? Like I'm standing there and I'm like, all right, I'm the motherfucking guy. Like I'm the I'm the guy. I'm the guy. Like, but it's I'm yeah. the guy. I'm the guy. Like you know, yeah. like there's that little bit of I don't care what anybody says. I don't care how confident you are. There's yeah, a little yeah, bit of yeah. creep of doubt in the back of your mind or fear or adrenaline or whatever, right? So I was standing there and just like, and as soon as he said that, everything changed. It was mm-hmm. so nuts and it was just like, I think I felt everybody's energy too, like all that, and it was just like, all right, I'm good. We're good. We got this. That's so yeah, sick. It was cool. That's sick. All right, another story, and I just have this one story, and then I have a question for you, and, yep. then, and then I'm done. Um, all right, one story that you, you've, you've told me, but I don't know if, how many people know it. Um, right, you're expected to be an early first-round draft pick. Um, you're expected to be an early fir- first-round draft pick. You're signed with Scott Boris. Um, he calls you, gives you a couple different options about where you could go and how to approach it and how you want to manage that. Do you want to go early? Do you want to trust him and, and go later? Why don't you walk us through that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so before my junior year going – so we won the national championship my sophomore year. I was the number one pitcher, all that stuff, all the great accolades. So going into 2010, my junior year was my draft year. I was number one player in the country, preseason Golden Spikes player. Mm-hmm. I was projected – this was – I can't remember if it was, like, the start of the fall. It might have been. I don't know. But, they like, Perfect Game and Baseball America came out with their first, like, draft rankings and stuff, and yeah. I was projected number one over Bryce Harper. So – that was like my like moment of like, oh, okay, this is like real. Like this yeah. this could be a thing, right? So there was a lot of talk of me being a top five pick, which at that time meant two and a half million dollars or more. Right. And so fast forward, I had some injuries my junior year and I was falling down draft boards a lot. Right before the draft, I go we go out to UCLA and we play at UCLA and I pitched really well. I pitched against Trevor Bauer. We wound up getting the loss. I gave up a home run that but I pitched well, mm-hmm. pitched like seven innings, had 10 strikeouts and like showed good stuff where Scott took me out to dinner that, or went, to, we went to dinner that night. Um, I paid for my meal. Um, <laughs> uh, and Scott sat down and was like, you did your job, man. You did good. I know this year hasn't been great, but I just want to let you know, you're going to have some options in the draft, you know, and we're going to have to decide what you want to do. And he's like, so you can be a first rounder, no doubt. Like I can get, not I, you deserve that. You've earned that. Yeah, yeah. You can be a first rounder if you want to be a first rounder. There's a chance that if you fall into the second round or third round, I can get you two point five million dollars. He goes, so if you're a first rounder, you might not. You're not going to get that two point five because a team's going to pick you in the first round, knowing your injury history, and they're going to try to get you cheap. The White Sox, the the A's, the Royals, you know, like under market teams that don't have as much money as the Red Sox, the Yankees and the Tigers. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the Red Sox and Yankees and the Tigers all picked at the end of the first round, but Scott knew that they had their first rounders picked. And so I wasn't going to be their first pick. So he told me, he was like, look, if you are okay getting to the sandwich round or the second round, you know, by putting a crazy price tag on your name and stuff like that, he was like, I feel confident that I can get you your top five money. And I was like, all right, bet. I trust you. Let's fast forward. Yeah. It's draft day. And we put this in place for this emotional reason. Um, we lost at UCLA. So this, so this was two nights before the draft. The draft's in two days or whatever, right, when I had that meeting with Scott. So then the next day comes, or two days later comes around, we're eliminated from UCLA and we're flying back to Louisiana. My season's over. The draft's going on. But it's going on while we're traveling. So I'm at the airport and I'm, we pull up, we check our bags, and the first round's going on. First pick overall, second pick, third, fifth pick comes around, sixth pick. Scott calls me. I'm in the airport. Our flight's leaving in an hour and a half. Hey, Anthony, I just want to remind you that you can get picked, you know, at pick 11, pick 13, and probably pick 18 if you want. The most that I can get you at those picks is going to be 1.3. He's like, I just want to make sure that that's not what you want, right? And I remember being like, can I call my dad? And he goes, absolutely. He's like, but you don't have a lot of time. He's like, it's probably going to happen in the next couple minutes if, if you decide. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. So I call my dad and I'm like, dad, I, can, I, I think I can get picked at 11 by, I forget who it was, White Sox or, or A's or something like that. I was like, Scott said that, you know, but I'm only going to get 1.6 or 1.3. He goes, Anthony, we decided this already. Mm-hmm. You're not taking that. You're, it doesn't matter. He's like, that's your ego. That's blah, 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 blah. He was like, listen to the man. We trusted him. We've put him in, in charge. He's done this a million times. This is why we did it, so we didn't make an emotional decision, like, on this day. I was like, okay. 
So I call him back and I'm like, nope, I want to, I'm trusting you. I want to, you know, get the money that I deserve and where, wherever that pick is. He's like, okay, it's not out of the question that the Yankees, the Red Sox won't pick you in the first round, but it might not happen. And he's like, I just wanted to make sure before you got on the plane, I sat in the corner of the airport and I cried, mm. like cried because I think my whole life you work so hard to be a first rounder and it's there in front of you and to choose no because you want, you know, to set your life up differently or put yourself in a better position um, financially. And, and it did, did put me in a better position with the team, right, when they invest that much money into you. Um, but it was really hard. I, I remember sitting in the corner crying literally before our flight was called and to the point where we were boarding and I was like, all right, I got to fucking clean my shit up right now. <laughs> like, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Like, yeah. so I clean my stu- myself up and get on the plane and I'm trying to like be pumped because everybody's pumped for me, you know, and they're like, dude, it's draft day. And I'm like, yeah, no, but in my head, I'm like, I could have got picked at 11 and, you know, like all this stuff. And so sure enough, I say no to, to that and I get on the plane undrafted and mm. we freaking land and everybody turns their phones on and they're all turned around. Congrats, bro. You got drafted by the Red Sox. And I was just like, so I turned my phone on and got the message and that was it. That's how I got drafted. So that I get off sick. the plane and yeah. I call Scott and I was like, hey, how did everything go? He's like, great. You got, you know, 37th pick or 39th pick, whatever it was. So it was still cool. I was a sandwich round, they called it. It was yeah. a supplemental first round. Yeah. So I was technically still a first rounder, which is cool to me at 33 years old, you know, to be able yeah, to say yeah, and yeah. talk about. Um, and I had a great organization draft me with the Boston Red Sox and I got $2.55 million. So at the end of the day, Scott said he was going to get me top five money and it was a little bit of a process, but... Um, he wound up giving me my two and a half, uh, 2.55. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. All right. So, so last question, I, I, I asked you three questions about how you, what made you commit to LSU, the, the moment in Omaha, you know, going into that last game and then getting drafted by the Red Sox. So we talked about those three things while sitting on the couch in your business on your podcast. <laughs> so if you could go back to your 17 year old self, not knowing where you're going to college with you know, with the perspective that you have all these things in front of you, what would you tell yourself? With all this perspective? Yeah, knowing that all of this was in front of you, what would you tell yourself? Enjoy it. Be present. Like, I think, I think when I look back and think about at 17 to 27, I think I was always in fear. I think I was always in fear of losing what I had mm-hmm. versus enjoying what I had mm-hmm. and being grateful for what I had and just enjoying the moment. I think what I was always fearful of is exactly what happened right now, but I love my life. So like, does that make sense? I think I was always fearful of getting hurt and never becoming the guy that everybody yeah. thought I was being the bust and all yeah. that stuff. I've done all that and I'm happier than I've ever been in my life. Yeah. And so I think I would have told 17 year olds, Hey, it's not going to last forever. Enjoy the fuck out of it, bro. Still be you, be exactly who you were, but just have a different mindset about it. Just be grateful, be thankful, just enjoy this micro moment of your life. You think that baseball is everything and it's going to be everything for the rest of your life, Mm -hmm. but it is a small fraction and there's going to be a lot of great shit on the other side of baseball. So just enjoy it while you, while you can, because being a professional athlete is not going to define you at all for your whole life. Yeah. So something like that. I think I would remind 17 year old, I was way more than a baseball player. Mm-hmm. And I think that I think something that I think was most powerful for me when I was done playing baseball was this is going to sound like kind of weird, but like understanding that I was attractive outside of being a baseball player. I always thought women were attracted to me. People would say I'm good looking and all this stuff because I was an athlete. Genuinely thought was, was yeah. you know, they just think I'm handsome because I play sports and I look good in a uniform and like all this stuff and I move well, whatever. I'm strong. I'm tall. But it's like, oh, now I'm not a baseball player and people still think I'm handsome, good looking, they're still attracted to me. I'm like, that gave me a lot of perspective of like, oh, okay, I'm going to be fine. Like, it's going to be okay. You yeah, know? yeah. So I think that would, that would be something I would remind myself of. Yeah, so. well, that's awesome. I think those were four amazing answers. Dude, this is why I know why podcasting is cool because I just talked about myself for like 20, 30 minutes and it feels good. Like it's cool to like talk about things yeah. and have somebody appreciate the stories and stuff like that or ask thoughtful questions and stuff, so. This is cool, man. I really enjoy this. We should do this more regularly. I'm down. Just shoot the shit. So. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, Appreciate absolutely. you. You should do the outro. but <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you guys for always being here and listening and subscribing. If you guys do, thank you. If not, please subscribe, like, share, do all that shit stuff. Try not to curse. Joe's being a good influence on me. So for all you guys that have complained about me cursing over the years, I'm trying to be better.
But seriously, thank you, Joe. I appreciate your time. Appreciate you sharing your story, everything that you do for cards and culture that you do for me as a whole. Um, and I hope that someday I can repay that to you and, and all that. So appreciate the time, bro. Thank you.